You're listening to The Portfolio Composer, hosted by me, Dr. Garrett Hope, where business and creativity go hand in hand. Join us at theportfoliocomposer.com for news, talks, and workshops. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Dorico Pro 3 is a major new version with game-changing advances in note input, notation, and engraving. Also available from Steinberg is Dorico Elements, an entry-level application that packs all of the essential power of Dorico Pro into a simple, streamlined package that is ideal for those getting started. Find out more later in the show. I'm super excited to bring to you a new thing at the Portfolio Composer. This is a mini-series, if you will, a series of smaller episodes focused on a particular topic. And this topic is on crowdfunding and Kickstarter. I first heard of the music of Christopher Tin a few years ago when recommended to me by another listener, and then I interviewed him. And you can hear that on episode 101, one of the best interviews that I've ever had the fortune of publishing. But about a year and a half ago, Christopher decided he was going to promote a new album on Kickstarter. I quickly jumped on the bandwagon and I became a backer myself because I simply love his music. It's that good. Christopher's Kickstarter campaign ended up breaking records. It earned over $221,000 with 2,852 backers. That's an average of $77.63 per backer. And his rewards ranged from $5 to up to $10,000. And he even had people backing at that high number. And now his music is recorded. It's being finalized, and he's starting to push out his rewards. This episode will be released in July of 2020, and next month, on August 29th, 2020, Christopher is going to do the digital world premiere of the new album. This is an album of large ensemble orchestral music with chorus and soloists, similar to his previous albums, such as The Drop That Contained the Sea and Calling All Dawns. His music is exciting and energetic and emotional, and he tells good stories. But more importantly, and I think appropriate to our new COVID times, this is a mini-series about how to raise funds to make the music you want to do. If you have questions about the ins and outs of running a Kickstarter campaign and a successful one at that, and how to think of your backers, the people who are interested in funding your music and want your music to come to life, As your primary thing, where your focus should be, this is the series for you. I encourage you to go to ChristopherTin.com to learn more so you can purchase your own copy of the music. Myself, I backed this album at the $100 level, which provided me with digital copies of his scores. I'm going to get a physical copy of the new album, and I'm going to get a study score version of all the music because I love studying Christopher's music, and I've purchased the study scores for the other albums too. All right. Enjoy. There are two reasons that one does a crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter. The first is, you know, you just want to raise some money to make your next artistic project. The second reason, perhaps the most compelling, is that you want to create advanced buzz for a project. And as I found out on this Kickstarter, announcing to the world that you're raising the funds and then, you know, getting all these people to contribute generates a lot of internet traffic around your forthcoming project and is a great way to sort of get out to the world that you're doing this. And if your project winds up, you know, staying at the top of the Kickstarter funding charts for a long time, which I think mine will hopefully do, it helps your project stay relevant and present in people's minds and discoverable in that sense, right? I think one of the big problems with creating albums and releasing them and so forth is that once you spend all this time making your album and you get it out there and it's distributed, after a month or two, after the newness of the distribution is done with, the public tends to sort of forget that this album is out there and they've moved on to the next thing. So in a way, a Kickstarter campaign is a way to extend the visibility of your next artistic project over a much longer time frame, and just to build a lot of excitement and to build a community. And ultimately, what you want to do is build this community of people that you interact with regularly, because those are the people who come back and will fund all your projects. So Kickstarter is also a great communication vehicle for you to connect with your fans, get them involved in the process of making an album and cement that bond between the creator and the fan, which is 
I think just an incredibly powerful thing. And I think it's something that classical musicians in particular are very bad at doing. And this was kind of like, I thought, just a great way to, to tackle all those problems all at once. At this point, Christopher and I switched our conversation to focus on the new economy of music, how people are accessing music, what that means, and how even those who want to pay for it can support you even though the old business models are no longer in existence. You know, the old model was that you release an album, you sell it, hopefully you make your money back and make some profit on it. But I think over the last 10 years or so, we've seen a shift in public understanding of music consumption. Like, I think people these days do not understand what paying for music after it's been created means. You can access music for free anywhere via YouTube, you know, Spotify. Like, it's very easy to be able to listen to anything you want. And so the public doesn't understand this concept of, oh, I can't listen to this new piece of music unless I pay for it, right? But what the public does understand now is the need for creators to have funds to create their work. Mm -hmm. So in essence, I'm going where the money is. In the public's eye, people are prepared to give money up front before the work is created, but not after it's been completed. So this is me shifting my paradigm to match the state of the industry is now. I think it's not so much that people won't pay music to an artist when they know that the artist needs to be supported. I think what happens is convenience, especially from things like streaming services, overrides that need to support a musician. So even though they may have the best intentions, like, oh, you know, I really want to support Christopher Tin because I like his music and I want him to make more albums, in the age of Spotify, there is actually no mechanism whereby a fan can actually contribute money to an artist in a meaningful sort of way, unless they go out of their way and they go and purchase a CD or purchase downloads or something in you know, a more traditional way. But let's say you're an average music listener, and now Spotify has come along and it's so convenient and you can get almost any music you want for $10 a month, right? You may think that you're actually supporting your favorite artist by listening to their music on Spotify. But in reality, that artist only gets about half a cent at most per stream. And so there's no direct mechanism for a fan to give money that will help support an artist anymore. In Today's music economy, there are fewer and fewer platforms by which a fan can directly support the artist whose music they love. And I'll give you an example. In the old days, if you went to a band's show at a bar or whatever, and you're like, God, I love these guys. I want to support them. I'm going to buy their CD, right? So afterwards, you stick around, you give the band $20, you get a CD. That $20 goes directly into the band's pockets, and they're able to use that money for recording their next album. But if you're a music consumer in this day and age, in the streaming era, where all your music consumption comes specifically from Spotify or Apple Music or Tidal or a streaming service, and you're not buying CDs anymore because everything you want is already there, and everything that, you know, all the old models of paying for downloads on iTunes and that sort of stuff has since been supplanted by your streaming subscription which is very convenient and replaces the need for having CDs and so forth, you no longer have a mechanism to directly support that band unless you buy a t-shirt or you go to one of their gigs or something like that. But the old model where patronage, i.e. listening to music after it's been created, leads to profits for the band doesn't exist anymore. And that's because Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, these services pay so little. They pay something like less than a half a cent per stream, right? So even the best intentioned fans, if they listen to your album like, you know, 20 times or something like that, you're still only getting, God, like a dollar out of that. I mean, that's not enough for most musicians to have money to create their next album. But what has come up in the last 10 years is crowdfunding. And people get this a little better, right? People get that, you know, a band needs money to go on tour and things like that. And it's a vehicle for them to extend their patronage at not just a fixed tier of like $10 a download or $20 a CD, but at any tier that they feel comfortable contributing to. And what I've found on this Kickstarter is that this month and a half of raising funds has already brought in way more than I could expect to make in the first month and a half of sales after the album was created. And that's largely because I'm offering things like 
personalized experiences for the fans and, you know, customized sheet music and, and all sorts of goodies, right? In the old days, I could expect in the first month to make maybe like fifty to $75,000 in album sales. And this Kickstarter has raised $221,415, which is way more than I used to be able to turn around. So what's brilliant about this is now I have the funds to make this album and I don't have to wait for the album to recoup before I make my next album because it's already pre-recouped in a way. Right. Yeah, you've pre-funded it. I've pre-funded it. Yep. And that's incredibly powerful mm -hmm. because now I don't have to think, oh my God, well, I got to wait another five years for this album to recoup before I make my next one. I can just finish this one and right away start thinking about the next one. And of course, I might have to do another <laughs> Kickstarter for the next one as well. But I mean, the point is like, this is a fantastic way of eliminating one of the biggest barriers to creation from a musician standpoint, which is financing, right? We're all sort of painfully aware of the money that flows in or doesn't flow in based on the success of our albums. This is a great way to pre-enable the next album. This episode is sponsored by Dorico, the future of scoring. And we want to feature real Dorico users so you can know that real composers out in the world today are using Dorico to make their careers happen. My name is Homayoun Kazemi. I'm a composer. I'm studying my master's degree in the Utrecht Conservatory in Holland. I study spectralism and I combine Iranian music melodies and a lot of stuff from my culture. There are these quarter tones that you can use. The fact that Dorico can play these quarter tones. The magic for me is parts. I hate making parts. But Dorico is like, hey, I will do it for you. Usually, like 90% of the time, it's what you want. And then you just do a little bit modification and then that's it. And that saves a lot, a lot of time. Even the print, even like I showed one of my teachers a print. And then he was like, wow, this is different. I mean, even the print looks different, you know, the fonts and, and I, I, maybe the DPI or something. I don't know, but, but it looks really good on paper as well. For contemporary composers and people who want to do graphic notation, Dorico is now going into it. It's, it's the beginning, but even now it's really good. Yes, I would definitely recommend Dorico. One of the main reasons and the first reason to get Dorico is the price, which is really good. And also you get a lot of features. You get the, the sample library, you get the ease of making parts because it saves a huge amount of time. When you're composing or when you're working, you don't really have to think about finding things. If they're just there, you just have to have a general knowledge about the shortcuts and the whole tap system, and then uh, it will go great. The kind folks at Dorco have set up a special web page so you can go and download a free 30-day trial copy of Dorico. So go and do that. I have been using the program, and I'm absolutely in love with it. Go to www.steinberg.net slash TPC. So did you consider Patreon as a potential resource? The problem with Patreon is it's a great model for people who create a lot of singles and maybe video content and, and you know, have a YouTube channel and are regularly able to churn out smaller amounts of content. But for me and my albums, they require live orchestral recording, live choral recording, soloists. They're very involved, painstaking processes, and you can't turn them out quickly. Patreon really works best if you're, for example, a singer-songwriter, and you record a song using just your guitar and singing into a microphone, and you make a little video of it or something like that. If your particular business model is that you can crank out a lot of content like that on a monthly basis even, Patreon is good for you, but it's not good for me in that it takes me two years minimum to make one of these albums. And I can't just have people contribute a little bit of money each time I make one of these albums. I don't have the same sort of model that would enable Patreon to be effective right. for me. But there are plenty of classical musicians out there who would, I think, that would really benefit from Patreon. And Patreon is one of these things where, like Kickstarter, you foster a community and you connect with your audience. And that is super powerful. There is a saying, I think, from you know, like the business world that goes something like, it's 10 times harder to bring in a new customer than it is to maintain an old customer. Yes. What you actually want to do is you want to take care of your fan base and your old customers because they will stay with you for life. Yes. And if they're young, 
like I have a lot of fans who are young and I get a lot of emails like I would love to contribute to your Kickstarter now, but you know, I don't have a job, right? Or I'm still a student or I don't have a credit card or whatever. Well, it doesn't matter now because like you foster those relationships. They'll be lifelong supporters of you. You know, you're in it for the long run, right? You want to build these connections. Being a good communicator to your fans, cultivating that fan base, it's really important. And Kickstarter and Patreon both enable that. One more thing I will point out is that people aren't quite prepared for how much work goes into running a Kickstarter campaign before it starts. Essentially, this is all that Gabriel did for the last month and a half. Am I right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is all he did, a full-time thing for a month and a half, making videos, communicating with fans. Social you know, media is everything. Social yeah. media. You know, yeah. Gabriel was like researching things like, okay, how do we issue vinyl for Chris's records now that people want vinyl? It was literally like 45 days of him doing nothing but this Kickstarter. And I'm fortunate that I have him in that I have someone who can take that heavy lifting off of my shoulders. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing this yourself, be prepared for this to be your main thing for a month or two, because it is a lot of work, a lot of work. Let's talk about fears a little bit. As this progressed, or when you hit the, okay, I'm launching the campaign now button, what was going through your head? What kind of resistance did you encounter? And how did you battle it? You know, the number one fear of around a Kickstarter, and it's one that actually took me years to get over. And also because times have changed, I was able to get over it. But long before you even start to think about doing a Kickstarter, or long before you actually do your first Kickstarter, you ask yourself two things. One, do I want to be one of these artists who does a Kickstarter? Hmm. And two, will people actually contribute? And I think number two is the bigger fear, really. I mean, one, you know, maybe five years ago, there was more of a hesitation to do fan funding for your next album. It's like, you know, you think to yourself, John Adams doesn't have to do a Kickstarter for his next none such record, right? You know, they just submitted none such just gives him a bunch of money and he just records with the city of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra or the LSO or whoever, right? Do you want to be one of these people? Do you want to put yourself like in the mold that the majority of independent musicians follow? But once you sort of let go of that and, you know, get over I'm not John Adams, okay? <laughs> like, so you, once you sort of let go of any pretension you have and, and embrace Kickstarter for what it is, you move on to the question of, well, can I actually raise money? How much money am I going to raise? The average music Kickstarter raises about $7,000. There are a lot that don't raise very much money at all. It just sort of happens. You can sort of hedge your bets a little by lowering your pledge goal to something that you know you can obtain. And that might actually even just take the form of reaching out to some of your friends and fans and saying, hey, I want to do this. You know, like, how much do you think you would be willing to contribute? And early on, yeah, one of my fears was, God, like, what if this does not catch on at all? What if nobody wants this? That's kind of embarrassing. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever pod catching app you're using and come to theportfoliocomposer.com to get on the newsletter. I will let you know when the next episodes in this mini-series are released. We're going to cover all the aspects you need to know to run a successful Kickstarter campaign. Until then, keep writing music. This episode of The Portfolio Composer has been supported by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Whether you're a composer or arranger, a teacher or student, working in music engraving and publishing, or working in producing music for media such as film, TV, and games, Dorico is the tool for you. Dorico comes in two versions, Dorico Pro for professionals and Dorico Elements, providing the perfect introduction to the world of scoring. Whichever version you choose, you'll be using software packed full of smart features that produces beautiful results completely automatically, allowing you to get music on the stand more quickly than with any other software. You can bring music into Dorico from your existing software using Music XML or MIDI, and you can try Dorico out completely free of charge for 30 days by downloading a trial version from dorico.com slash TPC. Try it today. <laughs>